All right, so I mentioned in the uh, the last video when we started it that one of the big things that were, were our goals in these last two sections or the last section in this section is to prove that uh, we have Newton's second law for rotation, and then it's alpha equals the net torque divided by the moment of inertia. And in this section, obviously, we're going to be diving into now the moment of inertia. Now, we had center of gravity in the last section, and um, it's going to kind of come into play with the moment of inertia. Um, I will for lead this by saying that um, calc-based physics has a lot more to say about this concept, the moment of inertia. Um, but for us, we're going to simplify it a little bit, uh, actually quite a bit, uh, because really the only way to solve moment of inertia is with calculus or with integration. So, uh, so yeah, we'll get into that in this section. All right. So if I simplified this and I said, well, what about, what about the angular acceleration um, for an object that's a particle? And we've talked about this before a little bit, but we know that the tangential acceleration is the net force divided by the mass. Um, and we know that in this case, the because it's a particle some distance away, that the angular acceleration is the net force um, divided by the moment of inertia, which is just the mass times the radius. And the torque is equal to the radius times the force. If I solve for force, then uh, torque divided by radius. And if I were to plug that in for right here, I would get an angular acceleration for a particle of tau divided by mr squared. So whatever torque is causing it divided by mr squared. So if I'm ever solving for angular acceleration of a particle that's pivoting about some massless rod, essentially, uh, this would be the formula. But I know that um, with everything that we've been talking about, we are not interested in particles anymore. So we have to determine the rotation or the angular acceleration of a rigid body. So let's take a look at that. So it, this is on the, on the right-hand side here. This is a rigid body, and it's got some mass and some center mass of this, and it's got some mass and some center mass here, some mass and some center mass over here, and it's all rotating about some fixed position. So if I have a rigid body that's rotating, um, we can think of this entire thing as consisting of a few different particles by taking a look at the center of mass, which gets really confusing. Um, obviously, this is a really weirdly shaped object, so it'd be really difficult to calculate the center of mass. But anyway, we could calculate the torque on each of our three particles, and because the object rotates together, they all have the same angular acceleration. Okay, so then what? So if I were to solve for the torque on each particle, that's essentially chunking off um, this into, into a few different chunks and saying these are the center masses of those chunks. Well, then I would add up all their net torques, um, which is just their mass times their distance away times their angular acceleration. And then I would say, oh, well, their net torque is the uh, sum of all of the torques. Uh, and that's going to equal the angular acceleration times m of whatever no, all the masses times all the radius is squared. And that gets us to our concept of the moment of inertia. If I were to rearrange that last equation and solve for the moment of inertia, it's just the sum of all the masses and their distances away squared. Don't have to understand exactly where that comes from, but that is um, that is the that is it. So if I were to have a bunch of uh, point masses, so there, here's mass one, here's mass two, and here's mass three. Oops, sorry and they're all rotating about this axis, I could solve for the moment of inertia based on each of their radii away using this uh, formula right here. Now, this springboards us into a conversation of how do we calculate this for something that's not a bunch of uh, little masses on points and, and actually something like a disk or a sphere. And the answer comes, well, that's where the washer method, in, which is one of the first things you learn in, in integration for calculus, comes into play. Again, we're not going to use that. We're going to keep it a little simpler. But anyway, the moment of inertia, how your mass is distributed, it's in units of kilograms meter squared. Um, and it depends on where it's rotating about, how far away it is, and how that mass is distributed. So again, this formula is good. We're going to use it like today, and, and that's about it. And I'll show you why in just a couple minutes. 
So this gets us into Newton's second law for rotation, the angular acceleration of an object, so as it's spinning about an axis, if it's speeding up or slowing down, is equal to its torque divided by the moment of inertia. And that's what's causing our angular acceleration. So here's an example. Um, <laughs> it's a really stupid example, but these guys uh, set up a little uh, scooter here, and the scooter's wheel is spinning, causing a torque on the merry-go-round, uh, and that causes the merry-go-round to angularly accelerate, and that starts spinning. And then one of these yo-hos uh, ends up flying off because of natural selection. So if I were to think about the moment of inertia, um, if I have three masses, and we kind of proved this with the figure skater, uh, these three masses in the first example are concentrated around the rim. And in that case, it's actually really hard to get the, pers the people rotating. But if those people go into the center of the wheel, it's actually much easier to get it rotating. Um, so we know that in this case, the mass is distributed very far away. So this object has a high moment of inertia. So if I'm applying the same force, it's going to have a low angular acceleration. So it's more difficult to spin something or to rotate something with a high moment of inertia. Going back to the concept of, remember we talked about the ring versus the disc? <laughs> uh, so here's the disc, here's the ring. If you remember that race, the disc won. The disc was faster than the ring because the ring has a higher moment of inertia because so much of its mass is concentrated on the outside edge that it was much harder to get the, the ring spinning, so it accelerated less rapidly as it rolled down the ramp. Okay, so to, to pair this up real quick, here's all the linear stuff that we talked about with forces. We have net force, we have mass, we have acceleration, and then we have Newton's second law for forces, or for acceleration. So now we have the exact same thing for rotational dynamics, and this is how we'll be able to solve our rotational dynamic problems. So instead of force, we have torque. Instead of mass, we have moment of inertia, which is how your mass is distributed. And instead of acceleration, we have angular acceleration. And then we still have Newton's second law for rotation. So everything that we did earlier in the year with forces, we can now do again except going in circles, and instead of the mass, or needing the mass or the net force, we need the moment of inertia, how the mass is distributed, and the net torque. And of course, since this is algebra-based physics, I will never make you solve for the moment of inertia. It is actually, it's often uh, a hit point on the calc-based physics exam, AP Physics C, uh, where you have to solve for these, um, but in our class and on our exam, you do not have to memorize these. They will either be given to you or they will be, um, you'll get a table like this. So here is moments of inertia for common shapes. So here is the, the disc that we talked about. Here's the ring that we talked about. And if we look here, the ring has twice the moment of inertia as the disc, right? So this is a coefficient of a half and this is a coefficient of one. So this has two times the moment of inertia which means it has half the angular acceleration. And that's why the disc wins as it goes down the ramp. Here we have, uh, we also have some solid spheres, uh, some spherical shells, um, slightly different moments of inertia. And then we also have some non-spherical objects. We have a thin rod going about its axis in the center, a thin rod going at the end, uh, and then the same thing for pieces of slab. Now, <laughs> these are common shapes that we'll use in, in AP Physics 1. But understand that there's an infinite amount of shapes out there, and the axis can be anywhere on those shapes, the axis of rotation. So when you do take calc-based physics, it, it does get a little bit more complex. We're actually going to do a more complex lab as well, where we talk about a roll of toilet paper. Um, and we talk about, well, it's kind of like a ring, right? but it has all this mass is really thick, thick concentrated. So is it a ring or is it a disc? And the answer is uh, it's both. It, and then you get a more complex um, moment of inertia when you use calculus to solve for it. Okay, so here's an, a quick example. It's a really corny um, title, uh, but if you get a big hammer, and I, I do it with the, the big metal mallet in class, um, so there's this big hammer and a majority of the mass of the hammer is located in the head. Now, if I try to hold it way at the bottom right here, 
Um, it's really hard for me to swing the hammer back and forth because it has a very large moment of inertia. But if I hold it right by the head, it's actually really easy because it has a very small moment of inertia. So it, it takes less torque for me to provide that angular acceleration. Um, and that's all based on the moment of inertia. It's how that mass is distributed based on its axis of rotation. So the last thing that we'll take a quick look at then is how it applies back to angular momentum. We've already covered angular momentum, but let's quick review. So in linear momentum, it was P equals mass times velocity. It was how your mass was, or how much mass you have and how fast it was going. In angular momentum, it's L, and it's the moment of inertia and the angular velocity. So this moment of inertia thing, that's how the mass is distributed. And we've talked about that um, but that's the whole point of this, is understanding that how your mass is distributed when you're not a particle changes how fast you can move and how fast you can accelerate. So remember, uh, the best demo was the figure skater example. We had someone spinning on a platform, a pretty low, a relatively low friction platform. They brought their arms in, and their, uh, when they brought their arms in, then they started spinning faster. And that's because their moment of inertia decrease. They brought the mass closer to the body, and the moment of inertia is just the sum of all the masses times the radius squared. So by decreasing the radius, they decreased their moment of inertia, and by doing that, they increased their angular velocity. So that is uh, angular momentum and how the moment of inertia plays into that. But the key concept is, if I'm not spinning you from an outside with an outside force, then your angular momentum has to be conserved. Just like linear momentum was before, at, during a collision, there's no outside forces, momentum has to be conserved. Cool, so that's your quick little look at um, angular momentum, uh, which is recapping essentially uh, moment of inertia, which is how your mass is distributed. We'll take a look in the next section about how we solve Newton's second law for rotation problems, uh, and we'll do that uh, in, right up next.